To understand the Star Spangled Banner is to know its fantasies and flaws, the bias and privileges of its era and its author, and its dreams of future possibility. Key Song is not an endpoint, but a contribution to an ongoing conversation about the country and how it might aspire to realize its potential. As music, Key's words were empowered to reach the heart alongside the mind, but it is vital that Americans today and tomorrow understand that his intent was not to inspire endless repetition of a static symbol and its unchanging story, but rather to task Americans with the responsibility of composing the nation's future. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining this American Inspiration event ably produced by GBH Forum Network. It's great to have you with us tonight in the land of history, of musical history, looking at our country's anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. I'm Margaret Talcott, Director of Literary Programs at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society and the producer of its American Inspiration author series. On your screen is the schedule for our hour-long event featuring Mark Clegg and moderator Christina R. Gaddy, both musicians and authors with deep knowledge of American history. Mark Clegg is Professor of Musicology and American Culture at the University of Michigan. He is Associate Dean at the School of Music, Theater, and Dance and Co-Director of the American Music Institute. He is our first ever music professor and professional musician in the American Inspiration Series, and we are delighted to have his insight. Tonight's moderator, Christina R. Gaddy, is also a musician. She is the author of a new book soon coming out, Well of Souls, Uncovering the Banjo's Hidden History, and also Flowers in the Guitar, another book. Christina's writing has appeared in the Washington Post, among other publications. We'll meet up with her in the second half of the program. But for now, Mark, welcome to you. We are so delighted to have you with us tonight. Um, you are Zooming in from the campus of the University of Michigan. Very exciting time of year there. Um, I've been eyeing your book for quite some time now, watching its success and really enjoying its facts and its insights. Um, I'm so glad that you're with us tonight and that you've come with some great tricks. Um, there's some music and videos on our way. Uh, Mark, we're thrilled you're here. Over to you. Well, thanks so much, Margaret. It's really, it's an incredible honor for me to be here with you today and, and fellow historians really across the world, as, as Margaret tells me, um, interested in genealogical research and historical research. And I think in so many ways, I feel a kinship um, because, I mean, looking into Francis Scott Key and his family, his own sort of um, family background, um, you know, his his father fought on the American side of the revolution and his uncle fought on the British side. So an interesting, complicated family. He had 11 kids um, and tracing all of them and their grandkids um, was a fascinating journey. And and then sort of the world of newspaper databases as we'll talk about. I mean, there's, there's just, in some ways I feel so lucky to be alive as a historian, you know, at this moment, because I did my training on, you know, microfilm readers and microfiche and working in archives with, with, you know, actual documents. And I still love that. I mean, there's nothing like going to an archive and just digging into the materials firsthand. There's that aura and magic, I think, of those sources. But then also to be able to look through literally thousands and thousands of newspaper clippings in, a, in an instant um, using you know, Chronicling America from Library of Congress or newspapers.com and the resources of the Massachusetts Genealogical Society are incredibly valuable for that that reason as well. So it's it's really, really cool for me to be here. And I'm and I'm so glad that you're including music in the series. Um, I certainly was inspired. I mean, American inspiration is a great um, topic for Francis Scott Key's The Star Spangled Banner. And I think in so many ways, you know, we you know, as historians, we're, we're trying to take these facts and all these points of knowledge we have and then weave the, the sort of emotional connective tissue between, you know, the, the things we know that happened and try to understand what it was like to be alive at a certain time. And, and music is a great window into that sort of emotional life of historical figures. And, you know, one of the things that, that comes through in the Star Spangled Banner is the way song was so much a part of early American life, of a 19th century life, 
you know, if in the 19th century in Francis Scott Key's day, if you were going to have music, you needed musicians, um, you needed to sing yourself. Um, and so his culture of songwriting, he wrote actually 10 songs, um, sub, you know, two, three popular songs, and then a, a bunch of church hymns as well, some of which are still sung today. So it's, I think the musical, you know, world and song in particular, because it puts melody and text together, is an incredible window into the past. So um, it's an honor to be here and to sort of bring music into the discussion at American Inspiration. Um, let's actually start with some music. I'm gonna, if, if we can make my PowerPoint work here, just give me a chance to uh, play from the start and then I'll share my, my screen. And we will listen to a musical example that I actually made here with my um, students at the University of Michigan um, and my colleague, Jerry Blackstone. And, uh, this is the original 1814 arrangement of the Star Spangled Banner. So this actually was a, a piece of sheet music that tells you exactly what notes to sing, what harmonies to use, and what the musical form of the piece is. It's a little different um, than we're used to today. Uh, one of my points is, of the book is that actually the Star Spangled Banner has been sung in different ways throughout American history. And so there actually is no precisely traditional or exact way to sing the Star Spangled Banner. And that flexibility, that multiplicity, that ability of music to invite different voices and different stylistic accents, and as we'll find out, even different words um, to the Star Spangled Banner um, as a commentary and conversation about the nation, I think is part of what makes this, this fascinating. So let me play this without, without further ado. And I want you to think about the question of how is this different than what you're used to in the Star Spangled Banner. Now I just gotta look at my other screen here. There we go. There we go. So that's just the first verse there. Um, they would have, there are actually three other verses to the Star Spangled Banner, uh, originally had four verses. What's different about that? Well, I, mean, I think one of the immediate things you'll notice is it's quite brisk and it's quite fast and uh, a little faster than maybe we tend to sing it today. Um, and that was because originally it's a song of celebration. It's a song of victory. It's a song, you know, with a kind of a sense of relief, a sense of surprise, a sense of incredible pride that the defenders of Fort McHenry in Baltimore had succeeded in repelling the British attack. So there's a, a joyous buoyancy to the original song and it has this tripper middle feel. It's actually in 6-4 um, for the musicians in the house, um, but it, it has this rolling kind of waltz-like feel. One, two, three, one, two, three. Oh say, can you see by the dawn's early light? So it has this, this celebrant, celebration um, sort of built into it. I call it a party song. Um, it's also sung by a soloist, by one person. Um, we tend to get lots of complaints today, or I get complaints, you know, the Star Spangled Banner is too hard to sing. Like, you know, I think when you have 100,000 people at the football game, not everybody can sing it. Well, it wasn't ever intended to be performed that way. It was in the 19th century was performed by a skilled soloist who could hit all those high notes. Um, and then the chorus, the, the crowd, the community responded by echoing back those final two lines that what was a chorus so that oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave with the land of the free and the home of the brave the question that it ends the first verse that we sing all the time at actually was repeated twice in the 19th century really up until about 1904 1905 when the community 
um, singing movement made this into a group song rather than a solo song. Um, and then that, that choral repeat became redundant because if everybody sang it together, then you didn't need to sing um, the last two lines of words twice. But initially in the 19th century, and as in Francis Scott Key's imagination, um, the Star Spangled Banner verses are actually a dialogue between the soloist or the lyricist in Francis Scott Key's case, and then the, the, the nation or the community echoing back those final two lines. And so, and we'll talk a little bit about the origins of the melody and why that, that dialogue, that call and response is part of the song. So the Star Spangled Banner is was born in, I mean, basically 208 years ago. So um, today is September 12th. Um, the Battle of Baltimore was September 13th and 14th. So, um, you know, 208 years ago, actually, the British were landing uh, at North Point, just outside of um, Fort McHenry on the Patapsco River, and were, were preparing a land assault that happened simultaneously with the bombardment of the fort. And so Francis Scott Key was held under guard um, in his own American truth ship, truce ship with a you know white flag, no guns. So this picture here, which is quite famous um, from the 100th anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner, you've probably probably seen it, it's called Dawn's Early Lights by artist Percy Moran. It actually is has a lot of mythology or error in it. And that's another thing about my book is I try to sort of unpack some of the mythology around the Star Spangled Banner and correct it. So Francis Scott Key was not a British prisoner on a British ship. He was actually taken back to his own American truce ship um, for this. He didn't have a big cannon on a, on a, a song or a ship of peace that was meant to negotiate the release of William Baines, a doctor who was taken prisoner in the, the battle of um, leading up to the Battle of Baltimore, the Battle of Washington, um, where just a month before the bombardment of um, Fort McHenry, the British troops had actually marched into Washington all but unopposed and burned the federal buildings to the ground in retaliation for the burning of York at the beginning of the War of 1812. So one of the, the sort of my favorite parts of, of my book is actually a map. And I'll just, I'll show you just a little bit of, this is a, a part of that map. Um, it's actually done by Gene Thorpe, who's the um, cartographer for the Washington Post. Um, I found him on the internet and said, hey, would you like to do this project with me? And, and this map has a ton of information in it, but it basically traces Francis Scott Key's journey um, up and down the Chesapeake Bay and where he meets with the British fleet and then what happens during the Battle of Baltimore. So he's basically a witness to a key moment in American history. One of the moments I think which galvanizes a sense of American identity and patriotism really that we, we still have today. Um, the, the Battle for Baltimore, the bombardment of Fort McHenry lasted some 25 hours, like hundreds and hundreds of shells were launched at the fort and the incredible heroism of the American soldiers and the militia who held the fort really against a superior British force um, and you know, just had the courage to, to stay um, and defend it and prevented the British fleet from coming into Baltimore Harbor and therefore being able to attack the city from behind um, the defensive lines and that would have allowed the, the land assault to happen. I mean, basically because the British fleet was prevented from entering the harbor, um, the British army decided it would be too costly to actually take the city and they retreated really without um, going full force into the battle. So the city was saved. Francis Scott Key felt this was divine intervention, nothing short of a miracle that had saved the city of Baltimore and was inspired to write a lyric to share that sense of passion, that sense of relief, that sense of hope for the future. Um, one of the other myths about the Star Spangled Banner that I unpack is that it wasn't written in a flash. So generally the story was told, at least in, in my childhood, that Francis Scott Key, the next morning after the bombardment, you know, the sun rises and he, he struggles to see what flag is flying atop Fort McHenry, um, trying to see if it's the Union Jack or the or Old Glory, the American flag. Um, it was not known as the Star Spangled Banner then because Francis Scott Key had yet to write the song. It's the song that gives the flag that, the name that we know it by today. Um, so he was struggling to see if the American flag was still flying. Um, the breeze picks up, he catches a glimpse, he knows that the American flag is still there, that the defenders have been successful, and that the city and the nation have been saved. And then, flash, all the words come to him. Um, in fact, he was stuck on board that ship from the morning after the battle, which was Wednesday morning, um, all the way until Friday night. And so he had the better part of 70 hours to, uh, to compose his lyric to the tune of Anacreon in Heaven, which we'll, we'll talk about. This is 
part of an interesting tradition, something that we've we've really for, maybe forgotten about today, but was incredibly common in the 18th and 19th century at a time when, again, if you're going to have music, you don't have recordings, you don't have radio, you don't have YouTube and Spotify. Um, if you want music, you have to make it yourself. And so a lot of people could sing. Um, singing in church was incredibly common. Singing schools you know, were part of the sort of cultural knowledge that you, you attained as an, an American at this time to allow you to, to sing in church. And so people knew a handful of common melodies um, that were sung to a variety of lyrics. Um, this is true true in hymnody, where a text like or a tune like Old Hundred, you know, has has dozens and dozens of hymn tunes that go with it. But also there were popular tunes, um, things like Yankee Doodle or To Anacreon in Heaven, which were commonly known in this era, that poets would write new words to the melodies in order to bring emotion into the commentary on the day's events. So if you know, the queen had passed away, um, you know, someone might write a new lyric to the melody of God Save the Queen, right, to, to celebrate the queen's legacy and give people a sense of not what happened so much. It wasn't about the town crier announcing the news. It was really about the emotional significance, I think, of the news. And so this was amazingly typical. This was, you know, I compare them to TikToks of today. Like everybody's, you know, young people are putting little snippets of melody and song onto their their video cameras on their phone, and then they're sharing it, you know, worldwide at this point through the internet. At this point, the way songs lyrics went viral is that the the words were published in newspapers, and every town newspaper editor subscribed to the papers of the neighboring towns to find out what was going on there and share news from that locale. And so these lyrics would get picked up, and they would go viral from town to town, and that's how songs like the Star Spangled Banner spread. Um, this unpacks another myth, um, which is that there, there actually are hundreds of lyrics to the tune we know only today as the Star Spangled Banner. They're often called broadside ballads, broadside being another name for the printed page or a newspaper. Um, I sometimes call them newspaper ballads just for simplicity's sake, but there were, there were literally, I think I have 582 of them um, that have been sung in American history to the tune we know as the Star Spangled Banner. And they include a lot of patriotic songs about the 4th of July, an enormous number of political campaign songs. There were three songs written for the election of um, Abraham Lincoln in 1860, all sung to the tune we know today as the Star Spangled Banner. There are temperance songs. There are women's suffrage songs. There are union rallying songs. Um, so just, just an amazing conversation about the country happening in song lyrics. Um, but when Francis Scott Key was stuck aboard ship, he was actually you know, writing a variation on many different lyrics that, that he had memorized in his mind, including a tune he himself had written before to the exact same melody um, called When the Warrior Returns, which he wrote in 1805 to celebrate the uh, heroism of Ch Charles Stewart and Stephen Decatur, heroes of the Tripolitan War. Um, but it was incredibly typical to write these melodies or these new texts to well-known melodies. So the, the melody was there first, and then Francis Scott Key writes a new set of words to match the music. So it is not true that Francis Scott Key wrote a poem that someone else later found fit the music. Francis Scott Key imagined the words from the start to this melody that we now know as the Star Spangled Banner. Um, how do we know this? Well, this is the initial um, printing from uh, September 17th of 1814 of the song, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, it has some interesting aspects to it that I think are really important to its history. One is that it has an original title, The Defense of Fort McHenry. It was not initially known as the Star Spangled Banner. Um, it includes the story of how the Star Spangled Banner was written, that a, a gentleman had left Baltimore, that's Francis Scott Key, basically witnessed the heroic defense of the city and then wrote this song to match it. And what's really important is that, well, there's the, the title, but if you see in the center of the page, right before you get the lyrics, oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light, it says tune or melody is Anacreon in heaven. So what is Anacreon in heaven? Anacreon in Heaven, or the Anacreontic Song, was the club anthem of a gentleman's club in London, England. It was founded in 1766. Um, it's 
club anthem was written in 1773 um, to lyrics written by the club president, Rafe Tomlinson, and set to music by one of the court composers, believe it or not, of King George III. <laughs> so King George III's composer, oops, I should, oh, there you, you can see him. I thought it was animated. Um, that's him right in the middle there, John Stafford Smith. I think probably no more appropriate American name than John Smith to have written the melody of the Star Spangled Banner, but in key fact was English, um, not um, not American. So this is an English tune, and of course we're culturally English. So in some ways it makes a lot of sense that popular music in the in early American culture, like Yankee Doodle, like Star Spangled Banner, like My Country Tis the Sea, which of course is God Save the King slash Queen, um, that it's all English music. Um, it's not really a drinking song, which is often considered to be. Um, it's a club song. Uh, of course, it was a gentleman's club, and in uh, um, 18th century England, if you're going to drink any liquid at all, it either has to be boiled or fermented because there's no water treatment plants in in this time. Um, so they they certainly imbibed quite a bit of alcohol. But it's I call it not a drinking song because it's not a song that's meant to sort of encourage or you know it's. Uh, the drinking of alcohol. It's not a pub song. It's a club song. Um, so this club, for example, um, started off its meetings with a two-hour classical music concert with string quartets, symphonies, um, solo songs, and other chamber music. When Franz Joseph Haydn went to London to premiere the London symphonies, he went to visit the Anacreontic Society because this was sort of the hip musicians club of, of London at the time. Anacreon was a Greek poet, Greek lyric poet, um, to us, it sounds old and fusty. Um, in 18th century England, this is when, you know, the Acropolis, when the marbles, Elgin marbles are being discovered and brought back to the British Museum. So Greek culture and Greek um, poetry is hip popular culture. This is sort of the new exciting discoveries of the day. So if you wanted to have a new hip musicians club dedicated to poetry and music, you named it after Anacreon, the Greek lyric poet. So this is a performance here, pretty much the same group of singers you saw earlier um, with only the men singing, because this is a men's club song. But this is a recreation of our imagining of what it might have sounded like to hear the original Anacreontic Society song um, in 1773 when it was written. And it, the song lyric sort of tells this kind of mythological, imaginary um, creation of the club, and it's sort of blessed by Zeus and Apollo, the god of music. So this is the first verse of the original melody. And if you listen to the tune and say the Star Spangled Banner words, you'll be able to match them up. So that is the original Anacreontic song. And you saw that interplay between the soloist, who was either the club president or the club president's proxy, and the members of the club who echoed back the words of their leader in fellowship. So that's it's a convivial song. It's a song that's meant to um, generate camaraderie, to devotion in the club, fellowship. So that's that's really, I think, what the song is, is about. Um, in, in essence, but that that dialogue between the soloist and the the membership is part of it. Um, one of the other questions I get asked all the time is why is the song so hard to sing? Well, the song is hard to sing because it's supposed to be hard to sing, which is to say that it's a song for an amateur musicians club and their star soloist to show off how super talented they are. So you don't want an easy tune to show that you have vocal range and skill and training. You want a hard song that not everybody else can sing, right? So this was meant to be a song that would showcase the talents of the members of the Anacreontic Society, many of whom were actually professional actor singers 
in Broadway, early history of Broadway in London, you know, what we often call the West End. So the West End shows were active in the 18th century, and um, the sort of stars of the West End on stage were honorary members of the Anacreontic Society, and they would be the ones who would probably be selected by the club president to carry off the club anthem, which would be sung right in the middle of their meeting. So they would have this two-hour concert, they would have dinner, then they would have an evening of, of singing together in fellowship, um, you know, sort of catches and glees and popular song in, in the English tradition from this era. Many of them were sort of formal and spiritual, but also many of them were jovial and fun. Um, so the songs that started, this, that kicked off that, that sort of episode of glee, if you will, that, that was the last two hours of their meeting was their club anthem, the Anacreontic song. Um, that song was brought to the, the to early America, to federal America in 1793 um, by a group of singer actors from London who wanted to make their careers in the new United States. And so they actually did a skit around the Anacreontic Society, sort of spoofing high society. And that's that's certainly part of where the drunkenness reputation of this tune comes from, um, because they, they hammed that up in their performances. And it was a great showcase for the actors because they could basically do a kind of variety show series of songs um, as part of that. Um, and then it got picked up as this broadside ballad melody, as, as the, the, the song became more and more popular in early America, it was used for political parodies um, initially in 1793 about the French Revolution. And then the song, the big hit that really made this melody popular in America was a tune called Adams and Liberty. It was written um, during a controversial part of John Adams, the second president of the United States, his term. He was the first one-term president in American history um, in 1798, the sort of quasi-war with France. And so early American politics, as I'm sure most of you um, have run across, was sort of defined by whether you were pro-British or pro-French and sort of the, the um, you know, the party of um, Adams was the Federalist, and Francis Scott Key was a Federalist, and they were pro-British, and then the Democratic Republicans and Thomas Jefferson were sort of in the pro-French camp. So this was a pro-British tune, um, you know, sung to Adams and Liberty, and and sung, and that that melody was the same one we've been talking about, the Anacreontic song. So it talks about the Alien, Editions, um, Alien and Sedition Act, and also includes the word slave, which is in Key's third verse to the Star Spangled Banner. Well, I'm sure we'll have time to talk about that. Um, Francis Scott Key, as I said, had written an earlier song to the tune of that we know as the Star Spangled Banner, When the Warrior Returns from 1805. It's one of the several reasons why I know for a fact. Um, not only is that tune there, but we, we have this confirmation from an earlier song nine years earlier that Francis Scott Key knew the melody. So I think I think what's fascinating to me about the Star Spangled Banner is is like just how many facets there are. How I, I call the anthem a living song, a living tradition, um, and it's this broadside ballad tradition is really what Francis Scott Key was was up to. He was commenting on what it meant to be American, on the courage it took for those men to defend uh, Fort McHenry on the, the lack of unity in the country, because it was actually a time not unlike today of incredible divisiveness between Federalists and Democratic Republicans. People were, the, the war was very controversial. Um, he saw, you know, the Star Spangled Banner as a kind of, as a, a, a song of hope to convince people to come together. And that's one of the things I talk about in the book is that this is not just a slapdash lyric that he wrote in a second. This is actually a very carefully constructed political statement calling for unity, trying to imagine a strong nation at a time when the United States was not strong. We couldn't repel the British fleet from our own shores. So, um, you know, in some ways in World War II, I think we, you know, when we, the greatest generation and the, you know, we become a world superpower. In some ways, we fulfill the promise that Francis Scott Key envisions. But I call the Star Spangled Banner from its very beginning, it's from its inception, a protest song, because it is imagining a world that doesn't exist. It's not Francis Scott Key talking and describing the world, the country he sees, rather he's describing the country he hopes will be. And this, this was very common to use um, the Star Spangled Banner, the lyrics, and to use new lyrics to comment on things, political issues like slavery, one of the most powerful broadside ballads that I've found um, written to the tune of the Star Spangled Banner is this one from um, 1844, which is actually written not very far from me at the moment in Michigan. Um, 
by an abolitionist minister named E.A. Attlee, and it's Oh Say Do You Hear. Um, you can find more about that online if you look up some stuff, or you can buy my book and read, read a whole chapter um, discussing protest songs and the Star Spangled Banner. But I think it, it's really the, the Civil War that galvanizes, I think, the sense we have, the sacred sense we have today of the nation's anthem, because it's the the Star Spangled Banner, the song that represents Star Spangled Banner, the flag, and the two of them together become this symbol and rallying cry of the Union um, of the North during the Civil War, the war to end slavery in the United States. And one thing that tells me that is one of these other important parody lyrics was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., premiered in Boston, where probably many of you are because of the, the location of the society, but um, from 1861 in February, and he wrote a fifth verse to the Star Spangled Banner adding it on to Francis Scott Key's original four that actually predicts the end of slavery in the United States because of the election of Lincoln. And the it was used as a recruiting verse for the Union Army during at the very beginning of the, of the Civil War, right at the, you know, just, just before South Carolina secedes. So without any further ado, let me invite Christina Gaddy to join us, um, musician, historian, and author and who's also on Norton with this new book, uh, Well of Souls. And I, I hope it's just a thrill, Christina, to have you um, in the conversation. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. That's um, really enlightening. And I, I will tell everybody who's on the Zoom right now that that is just a scratch of the surface of what Mark has been able to get into. Oh, say, can you hear? And um, I think, you know, even, you know, you just see from the cover that there's so much more there to touch on. So hopefully we'll get um, into that here and maybe with some of the questions uh, from the audience. I, I, I heard somebody say this once and I think I'm just going to steal it, which is I'm going to take my opportunity as moderator to ask at least one question that I really <laughs> um, <laughs> want to ask. Um, and so you touched on it in your presentation and, and talked about it, about how common it was for people to compose new lyrics to existing songs. And again, not just in Key's time, but extending all the way into um, the Civil War. Can you talk more about kind of why music was the reason that they would would make these, you know, in some cases, political statements, um, but other times with broadside ballads, just telling news of something that happened. And, you know, you get into like whole murder ballad traditions that go way back. But but what was it about music at this time that you thought kind of made this the, the medium by which to communicate uh, this news, if you will? No, that's a great question. And, you know, as a folk musician yourself, I'm sure you know a lot of these these melodies, but they, you know, I, I really think it is about, you know, sort of the emotional processing of life in this era. I mean, what does music do, but it brings sort of melody and words together, right? I mean, in, in song anyway. And, and uh, you know, I, th I think the newspaper, you know, was the major means of, of communication, right? The printing press, um, and every town, you know, had multiple newspapers, um, local newspapers, and the freedom of the press is so vital to, to early American political life and political life today and the thriving nature of our democracy. And that, that discourse, that ability to, to publish and share news was essential to the creation of, of the United States. But what the news doesn't really have at this time, and you have to remember, that, I mean, I think of it technologically, this is before photography, this is before radio, it's before recording. You know, if if you're going to add that other dimension to the news, that that sense that you were really there, that you were a witness, that you understood and sort of could process the the emotional significance of the day's events, you had to have something else. And, you know, there, of course, were illustrations of this time. You know, you could do line drawings of things. And those, of course, were published in newspapers. But, you know, that's slow. It, it takes quite a bit of time. I um, mean, even publishing you know, normal music right, where you have sheet, you know, note, musical notation with all those dots and lines, right, that tells musicians what to play, um, that was a very slow process. I mean, it had to be hand engraved on a metal plate and then printed. I mean, there was some, some immovable type in early printing, but, but again, relatively slow and very expensive. But this ability to just publish words to be sung to a, a melody that everybody already knows was incredibly accessible. You know, I mean, imagine like, for instance, if we wrote new lyrics to happy birthday, like everybody knows the tune of happy birthday, right? And so you could, you could read these words and imagine the melody in your mind's ear 
And I think if we, or you could actually sing them, right? I mean, that's that's the other thing that's done. And, and if you look at Key's lyric, for example, you know, one of the things about the Star Spangled Banner people always talk about is are those high notes, like how hard it is to sing, you know, and the rockets were glare, the bumper thing, you know. Um, I, I'm firmly of a belief that the Star Spangled Banner is not hard to sing as long as you start low enough. The, the, what's tricky about the song is that it's very comfortable for the first two phrases, and then it gets way uncomfortable, right? Um, if you had to start singing the high notes, you would never make a mistake, right? Um, but those high notes are the, the point of emotional tension in the melody. And, and what's interesting about the, the structure of it as a melody is it basically has a kind of like narrative structure, like a, a novel, right? It starts with, you know, an introduction, and then it gets to this climax, and then it has a resolution in every single verse, because the high, the high notes are always sort of in halfway through. Um, so when Francis Scott Key is telling the story, of the Battle of Baltimore, and he's talking about the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in there. I mean, that's the that's the violence, right? That's the moment of anxiety. That's he's wondering if one of those is going to hit the fort and and destroy it, and and you know, Baltimore and the nation will be lost. And and it's dark, and he can't see the flag, right? It gives proof through the night because the only thing he can do is he hears the sound and sees the flashes. He can't actually see the flag because it's dark, and so. Um, so that emotional high point is are those words, and and if you look at every verse of the Star Spangled Banner, there's a really careful use of emotion in Key's words, and that's another reason why we know he he didn't just accidentally write a set of words that could be sung to that tune. But I really think it's the emotional it's it's the emotional window into the time into the history, and and that's you know what we get tonight today on our phone with with you know seeing live video from any place in the world when there's a battle or a crisis you know when you know just referring to the queen and you see buckingham palace and you see the flowers on the front you you don't you can't feel like you're there in 1814 you feel like you're there because it's transmitted in music and that gives you the emotional sense of that you were that it makes it vivid yeah I love that. I think that's so important. And, you know, I hope, I hope we can, even with live streaming from all over the world, we can retain that music can, can bring us that emotion. And I feel like you've, um, you've basically answered another question that I had that, um, you know, that you write in the prologue that the Star Spangled Banner has served to bring passion, energy, and conflicting opinions to urgent issues of the day. And as you point out, that was even before, you know, it's the Star Spangled Banner, as we know it, that that melody was doing some of that. Um, and I think I think you've basically answered it, which is that, you know, what is it about this melody that kind of lends itself not only to being rewritten, but to being such a important way for people to tell stories even after it becomes the Star Spangled Banner? Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because I mean the in political discourse through song, the two major tunes are Yankee Doodle and Ant to an Acreon in Heaven. And um they're very different. I mean uh, Yankee Doodle is used for these kind of insult songs, right? It's normally it starts out as a British insult of of the the you know the sort of silly Americans, right? They're Yankee Doodles um, with a noodle in their cap. Um, so whereas an in Heaven has this kind of sophistication to it, this sort of literary sheen, but also lots and lots of words, right? So each each stanza has eight lines, and each line has has lots of syllables. And so you can talk and give a lot of information, a lot of ideas. You can tell a very complex story through an Akron in heaven that you can't talk in Yankee Doodle because it's really short, pithy lines. Um, so so they have a they each have a very special function in Amer early American politics. If you're if you're trying to like vilify the enemy, you know, you use Yankee Doodle. If you're trying to celebrate your the sophistication and sort of history or tell a tell a more complex story about your candidate and how great they are, you use an Acreon in heaven. So, but yeah, super, super common. I mean, in fact, if you if you take those 580 that I've found and you line them up from the earliest, which is 1790 by Francis Hopkinson, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. And then the most recent one actually, as far as I know, is Amanda Gorman wrote a parody lyric in a, mm. to the Star Spangled Banner this year to comment on the tragedy of the Highland Park shooting on July 4th, which is very moving. Uh, I say parody not because it's silly or it's diminishing, but just that's sort of technically what you call it when you when you write a new set of lyrics to a, to an old thing. Um, so they they're happening now. But if you line them up from earliest to latest, Francis Scott Keys is number one thirty six. So he he didn't start this game. He he's contributing to this ongoing conversation about the country through song. Yeah. Um, and we have a question um, from the Q&A that I think is very good, which is why, 
is it? So the, the question is, why did I think it was a poem and later put to music? But I think the bigger question is, why are there so many misconceptions about the Star Spangled Banner? Why is it, oh, Francis Scott Key wrote this poem in a flash of brilliance and then, oh, it happens to, you know, fall to this music or, um, yeah, I mean, even just what ship he's on and, and all of these types of things. What, where, why did, do you, you know, do we have any reason why, why it lends itself to such mythologizing? It was so I could write a book, Christina. <laughs> um, no, that's a great question, actually. And, uh, you know, there's a couple things about it. I mean, I think most of what I know about the Star Spangled Banner, or at least I knew when I started, was actually sort of imagined from the song lyric itself. I mean, the, the song sort of contains its own history, right? It talks about the Battle of Baltimore. And we. so I, I think in some ways we think we know more about the song than we do because it sort of tells us its, its own story. Um, but the other reason is that Francis Scott Key never wrote down the the actual sort of direct account of what it was like to write the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and some of that was that he was a gentleman. Remember, he doesn't even, that initial printing, he doesn't even put his name on it. It doesn't say by Francis Scott Key. It just says a gentleman of Baltimore or a gentleman from Baltimore. So it it, it was sort of, you know, this, this commentary in a way was... Um, it, it, it was meant to be, I don't know, sort of high class and gentlemanly not to take credit for it. I mean, he was not a professional songwriter, right? Um, Stephen Foster wasn't around yet. It was our first professional songwriter. But um, but I think the other thing about it is, is it kind of some of the mythology that we know sort of enhances the drama of the song. Like it's the 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 patriotic sincerity of Francis Scott Key is only that much more vivid if it comes to him in this sort of burst of inspiration, right? It's not a it's not a political propaganda song. It's it's pure. It's you know. So we sort of imagine some of these things that we wish were true, um, but it turns out it's he's really writing a political song of the era. It's it's not it's not just a, a pure patriotic um, flash of inspiration, but in a sense, it helps invent invent American patriotism in order to create the unity that he's hoping for. So I think in some ways the the mythologies only emphasize how the heroism of Key or like the heroism of the defenders and sort of it's the sincerity of the statement. Yeah. Um, and Susan also asks, were there no restrictions to using someone else's melody? So the lyricist becomes known, we all know Francis mm -hmm. Scott Key's name, but the composer is forgotten or at least, you know, not well known. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I tell a little bit of the chapter two of my book is all about the music. And it's, it's got a lot of really interesting new detail in it. But one of the most amazing things is we didn't know for absolute certain who the name of the composer was until 1977. So the year after the bicentennial. Um, but yeah, there were no restrictions. So copyright law in the United States sort of comes out because of the, uh, the constitution, which provides for the creation of copyright law. And it's, it's created in the, I think the, the 1790s. And, uh, but it does not apply there's no treaty with Europe. So it doesn't apply to any publications from England or the continent or any other country. So you could use um, a melody from England with impunity. There was no copyright protection um, at this time. And actually, in a, so in a sense, there's a kind of advantage to, to publishing sheet music, for instance, of Adams and Liberty um, by using a tune that's, that's not composed by an American, because if it was, you would have had to pay pay rights on that theoretically. I mean, it's one of the reasons why Gilbert and Sullivan is so popular in America. Like people think, oh, it must be just really wonderful. Well, it is wonderful, but it was also free, right? So if you did an American Broadway show in throughout the 19th century, you had to pay rights on it. If you did Gilbert and Sullivan, you didn't. Um, and so kind of following up on that, because you, you touch on it when you talk about this in the book, what other songs have been considered for our national anthem? One of our attendees wanted to know that. Yeah, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, the, the whole history of anthems and how anthems are sort of proclaimed and made official is, is one of the things I explore in detail. And, uh, you know, in some ways I say that sort of anthems are born and not made. Like you can't, there's been all these competitions in American history to write anthems and every single one of them amounted to nothing, like all these winners. Like, so you, you have to have sort of a magical moment and sort of a historical moment that, that sort of shines a light and captures some kind of national ethos to have an anthem. But there are many, many songs like that in American history. Um, America the Beautiful is often mentioned to me as, as a song that some people would prefer as a national anthem. And in some ways it's a, it's a less complicated song. Um, 
the there are other Yankee Doodle was considered. Hail Columbia was was the song really that predated Francis Scott Key as a kind of national, predated the Star Spangled Banner rather as a national symbol. Um, and you know, there's always controversy. A lot of people didn't like the Star Spangled Banner as the choice because it's too hard to sing. It was a British tune. It was associated with alcohol in an age of prohibition, right? Because it was 1931 when um, Hoover signed the bill that made the, the anthem official. But my one of the arguments I make is that it's not Hoover's signature that makes the anthem, makes Key's song the anthem. It's it's what people did with it. And so it's the fact that the the symbolism between the flag and the song were married in a in American cultural usage, that there was a kind of symbiosis um, from the Civil War forward, right? There were no flat, no stars were taken off the flag. So it becomes the symbol of union and, and it's made sacred by that war. Um, so it's it's really that moment that's the turning point because of Francis Scott Key's choice to use the flag as the poetic image, you know, and the words in the repeated chorus at the end, right? That becomes the title of the song. And it's and it's that image that that really burrows itself into American cultural identity in a way that that makes the Star Spangled Banner the only possible choice as national anthem in 1931, because it's the one people have been literally using for 70 years in that ceremonial role as a symbol of the country. So so it's it's sort of it's that's really what makes the the tune, you know, into the anthem. And I think, you know, you sort of asked about this earlier, but the 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 because the the melody is hard to sing, because it takes a kind of athletic, almost a heroism to perform. I mean, I think it captures a kind of spirit of American, you know, energy, devotion, pioneer, like all those those ideas that we use when we talk about American history, right? The the sort of thirst for liberty and that that commitment, that willingness to sacrifice, individuality, that heroism, that's so much a part of of how we think about ourselves. That a tune like God Save the Queen, right? Which is has a very narrow compass and is to me is sort of sort of dirgy, right? I mean, sort of D, 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 D. Yeah. It's very yeah. sort of narrow and repetitive. Whereas we're like, I mean, right out of the gate, that melody is going do 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 do. I mean, you've already traversed a full octave of the piano, mm -hmm. like five notes, right? And so there's there's something like vivacious and energetic and I think very distinctly American about that. And and that I think is another reason why, for me, I argue that, you know, it's at times of war or times of crisis when we need to galvanize and bring people together, that the melody, the music of the Star Spangled Banner does that. And I, and I have a feeling that America the Beautiful would make a great anthem at peacetime. But when mm. when when your when your life is on the line, you need something that's going to carry you into battle. And historically, anyway, the Star Spangled Banner is the melody that's done that for Americans. And that kind of brings in another um, question uh, the, that's tied to one that I had, but also one that the audience, uh, somebody in the audience had, um, which is you explained from the very beginning of like, you know, the, the 1814 version isn't quite what we're used to today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, I was playing it on my violin, my fiddle, and it was really hard because you're like, okay, don't do it. Like you hear it at the ball game, do it. Like it's written on the paper. And, mm -hmm. and that can be a little difficulty, uh, or, you know, you can have some difficulty with that. Um, but then also you get, you know, Jimi Hendrix, who's joining us, zooming in from behind you there, um, Whitney Houston, Rosie O'Donnell, and, and you bring this up in your book of kind of, you know, that there isn't, there is a state, like, yeah, there, you can get sheet music for the Star Spangled Banner, but there's also this room for liberty, to take liberties within mm -hmm. it. Um, can you talk about, like, why that happens, how that happens, what is that kind of you know, how, how we should take that as Americans. No, that's such a fascinating issue and something, you know, I think in the 19th century, you know, the way you brought sort of new ideas to the Star Spangled Banner was to write new words for it. In the 20th century, the way you did that was to, to perform it with a kind of stylistic accent, right? So Whitney Houston brings that sort of incredible gospel passion to that performance at um, Super Bowl 25 in 1991, I think. Um, and, you know, many people hear that as the, the sort of quintessential performance of the Star Spangled Banner, so, so sincere, so powerful, so traditional. Um, but if you actually look at that musically, it's not traditional at all. I mean, it's, I talked about at the beginning, that sort of rolling triple meter, you know, oh, say, can you see by the one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Um, Whitney Houston sings it in 4-4, four, four, which, you know, 
maybe super technical for musicians, but like, it's like, like mind blowing, right? I mean, how can you do that? How can you add an extra beat to every single measure, right? You, you basically turned a waltz into a march or, or more accurately, a waltz into a sacred hymn, right? Because most of our, our church hymns are in 4-4, right? So like, um, you know, amazing grace, right? Um, so it's, it's, it's that feeling, I think, that that's part of what adds that sincerity. And of course, Whitney fills that with her glorious voice. And it just, it makes so much musical sense. And it's so sincere and so powerful that we hear, I think, the sincerity as ringing true for us. And that's what makes it traditional, right? So if we hear it as true, then it's great. And if we hear it as false or commercial or self-aggrandizing or insincere, we forget the words, like all those are, are pitfalls that are that are, are really a problem and people can get into lots of trouble um, in national events like the Super Bowl if they were to mess that up. So I, th I think, you know, but the flexibility for me is really the key to the anthem. And, um, you know, you can sing it slow for a funeral, like a military funeral. You can sing it fast for, you know, a, a game. I conducted it recently, actually, at a Michigan football game. It was probably the high point of my musicological career, getting to perform for like 70,000 people. But, you know, I had to move it along because they had a game to start. So I was not allowed to go too <laughs> slow. Um, and, I, and I think really the key is sometimes when there are controversies about the anthem and I'll, and I'll try to close. The yeah, I was, I was going to say we're almost at the end. And yeah. I, do, I do think, you know, we eight minutes is not long enough um, to, <laughs> to talk about this, but we had kind of two questions. And one was, you know, um, just the basic of uh, and and I'll just sit, tell, tell everybody I'm zooming in from Baltimore and um, I'm on the Historical Society board and we have you know, deal with a lot of these issues um, when kind of, you know, what are we venerating and what are, and how are we memorializing things? Um, so was Francis Scott Key a slave owner? Did he free the slaves that he did own? And then also the, you know, that third verse that has the word uh, slave in it. And you talk about this a lot in the book, but kind of just maybe briefly talking about the, the controversy over both Key as the writer and of that particular lyric and, you know, yeah. Yeah, no, eight minutes is definitely not enough time for this. Um, it's actually chapter eight, ironically, of my book. Um, so, and I, and I, it's the longest chapter in the book for a reason, which is this is an incredibly complicated issue. And one I really struggled with after Colin Kaepernick's um, protest. And it really made me, I think, look, challenged me to look deeper into these questions. Francis Scott Key was indeed a slave owner. Um, he was, you know, owned probably a, a dozen people during his lifetime. He freed the first of the people he owned um, in 1811, was a little girl, um, uh, released this young child to um, her mother um, in 1811, so three years before he wrote the Star Spangled Banner, and he freed um, all of the rest of his slaves, either during his lifetime or by his final will and testament. Um, he also, interestingly, was a founder of the American Colonization Society, and he's sort of on both sides of the slavery question um, in the sense that um, he fought in court on behalf of black men, women, and children for their freedom. If, if they were um, sort of unjustly enslaved, he would take on their case for free to fight for them. So he, in his course of his legal career, he was responsible for freeing at least 189 people. So he doesn't fit the categories of abolitionist or slave owner in the way that we think of today, that people were on one side or the other of the slavery question. He was really trying to look for a kind of pragmatic middle as a sort of a political figure, as a public figure in an age when slavery was legal. So complicated character, but this is the legacy today. So the word slave is in the third verse. Um, you know, and I think one of the things I spend a lot of time talking about are the three possible interpretations. One is a reference to the colonial Marines who were escaped black men who fought on the British side, who could be, you know, sort of insulted as slaves and the, the, you know, and traitors to this, to the United States. Um, and the third verse really mocks the British enemy. But what I really think Francis Scott Key meant by that, which is a kind of myopic and hard to believe from our current perspective, is that the word phrase hireling and slave actually referred to the white British soldiers who were, you know, paid mercenaries and they were beholden to a king. So they had to flight, fight for King George because he said so, because they were enslaved to the king. Whereas the, the, the good guys, the Americans, were free militiamen who fought for home and country of their own free will. So the fact that Francis Scott Key could use that word in a poem that, or lyric rather, that's that's unifying people 
and use such a divisive word um, really just shows the centrality of sort of the white male perspective in 1814 mm -hmm. that, that people could could misinterpret that that way. So it's amazing. It's worth I think digging into the details of that in my book if if you are so inclined to to get. I, yeah, I absolutely agree that um, that's a really important part of the contemporary discussions, and we have to kind of fully understand um, the background when when we're talking about it. So. Again, Mark, thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who asked questions. You know, just can't express enough how interesting of a book this is that it um, brings in so much American history from, you know, the 1700s uh, basically to the present um, and really important. Uh, Christina, thank you too. Really, you oh, did a absolutely. really wonderful job as a moderator. <laughs> Um, and you both have given us such one great and interesting history. I love it that you worked in the history of Yankee Doodle and um, Stephen Foster as our first professional songwriter. Um, it's amazing what a living tradition this has. It's a protest song, aspirational, inspirational. And in that spirit, as we do for all our American inspiration authors, we've asked Mark to read to us briefly from the book in closing. So back to you, Mark, and then I'll come on back for a good goodbye. Great. Well, yeah, Margaret prepped me for this, so I, I chose a, um, a paragraph from the concluding chapter um, that sort of sums up for me where we are now with the Star Spangled Banner and its value for us today. To understand the Star Spangled Banner is to know its fantasies and flaws, the bias and privileges of its era and its author, and its dreams of future possibility. Key song is not an endpoint but a contribution to an ongoing conversation about the country and how it might aspire to realize its potential. As music, Key's words were empowered to reach the heart alongside the mind, but it is vital that Americans today and tomorrow understand that his intent was not to inspire endless repetition of a static symbol and its unchanging story, but rather to task Americans with the responsibility of composing the nation's future. Uh, now, moving toward closing, we at American Ancestors NEHGS are delighted to have presented tonight's book talk. If you're researching a time in history, a family, or a national passion, our library and research center would be very useful to you. The stacks on Newbury Street in Boston's Back Bay are open to the public. NEHGS members can delve into our digital archives anytime, gaining access to 1.4 billion searchable family records, uh, included many of Francis Scott Key's relatives, of course. Um, free to the public, you can chat online with a genealogist. Our Brew Family Learning Center hosts many educational programs geared to all levels, from those new to researching to you pros out there. In October, we'll look in depth at navigating our nation's federal records in an online seminar. We'll also gather experts to discuss how to uncover hidden histories, the life stories of those left out of written records. You'll find more information and registration at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. Our mission at NHES is to educate, inspire, and connect. We hope you we've accomplished that in the past hour. To tonight's spar Star Spangled guests, Mark, joining from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Christina, zooming in from Baltimore, Maryland. How perfect is that? Um, we truly thank you both for your insight, giving us a window into history. Thanks also to the team at GBH here in Boston and to our audience. You are great to hop on board. We appreciate your continued curiosity and your shared love of history. We hope to see you soon again. And for now, we wish all of you a good night and thank you. Thank you.